This is a docking station, and I've done over two and a half million dollars in sales with it. And in today's video, I wanna go over how I went from zero to that two and a half million dollars. So I make a lot of videos on my channel about projects that sell and how to make money woodworking, etc. I thought it would be very necessary to tell this product story of how I went from that zero to two and a half million dollar mark and all the trials and tribulations that came along the way that really catapulted me from being that hobbyist woodworker to that more professional style woodworker and all the luck that I had along the way to get to that point because trust me, it wasn't all skill, it wasn't all knowledge and so I just felt almost obligated to tell you this story because there's so much value packed into it whether you're a small hobbyist woodworker, a weekend warrior or you own a full-time business. So stay tuned and once again, I hope you grab a lot of value from this video. This means a lot to me and kind of my whole company so thanks for watching, let's get right into it. I'm Ryan Drapella, I'm 27 years old. I'm from the small town of Ocampo, Texas, and then I'm a CEO of Frio Coolers, Drapella Works, and Cutting It Close. So the product is called a docking station or a phone dock, and I've actually coined the term man stand because mostly women bought it for their husband um, or their boyfriend to put it on their nightstand. And what it did was it held a phone, a watch, a wallet, keys, all of that stuff. So it kept like, it's almost like a catch-all tray. It just was presented in a very nice way. And so we coined the term man stand, uh, but it's really just a phone docking station or a phone dock. So whenever I got the inspiration for the man stand, I just turned 20 years old. I was a sophomore in college. It was 3.30 in the morning and I was bawling my eyes out in my parents' office at the computer. I was doing woodworking for about four years at that point, trying to do it full time, doing it full time, and I had to pay for college. My truck just got in a wreck. And so I had very little money in the bank account, less than 200 bucks, and I didn't know what to do. And what I was currently doing was barely making ends meet and I was working 60 hours a week while trying to go to college and it was extremely rough. So what inspired the design of this docking station? Well, about a month earlier, I was watching a video over this one Etsy shop that did over a quarter million dollars in sales with only one product. And I was like, that is awesome. And then I kind of forgot about it. And then when I was just bawling my eyes out, I had that flash come to me and it's like, Ryan, why don't you just do that? I started kind of designing one similar, but most of them had two pieces of wood that kind of slid in together. And so what I did is I knew I had a CNC. I cut a little part out in the center where only people with the CNC could use it. And so it differentiated the design enough to where I was different than his. And the one that did multi-million dollars in sales was my original design. I had zero prototypes. That was the one I went with. And that's the one that sold like crazy. Did people think it was a good idea? Oh, oh no, absolutely not. My parents didn't think it was a good idea. All of my brothers, they still cannot believe it did what it did. I thought it was ridiculous. I didn't think it would go at all. Who's gonna buy something so stupid? <laughs> Ryan first showed me the phone dock after I got finished laughing. It was, well, let's give it a try. Didn't really have support from any of the sides. They were like, well, this is just a little doodad. This is another one of your hundreds of products you try to design and it's gonna flop. But I had a lot of faith in it. Nobody in a million years on my side of the family thought it was gonna do good at all. The tools that I used to make this was strictly a CNC, a router table, and a random orbital sander. So I made this out of a five foot by five foot Baltic birch. Uh, it was a 12 millimeter, so which is about a half inch thick. And I made all of my docking stations out of that from when it started till even now. The first time I got all the materials from it, so I, I used to go to this, this place called Houston Hardwoods. I had about $120 to my name, and I went there and spent $119.28 on the first five sheets. And we thought, oh my God, we're gonna get broke. It's we spent a hundred dollars on plywood. I drove back home and was like, this better work. And it was so interesting because we made those first couple ones out of those five sheets. And I went back two weeks later and bought 13 sheets with whatever money I had left. 
it about killed us driving over there, getting those sheets, coming back, and cutting out more phone docks. And every time we had a mess up, we knew, well, that's money out of our pocket. This is the CNC room. We originally cut them all out on this CNC, but then after we got busy, we cut them out on that CNC that you see behind me. You can actually notice on this table where we used to screw down the plywood to hold it down before we cut out the original docking stations that we made until we got that one, which has a vacuum table, which held all our products down a lot easier. So was my production process efficient? Absolutely not, but it worked. Um, I think what really helped is I had very low overhead because I was working out of some horse stalls and a yard and I didn't really have, you know, insurance or taxes to worry about or stuff like that. So besides the CNC taking a very long time to cut them out, sanding was probably the second worst. And we literally just put sandpaper around our fingers and go like this a whole bunch and then try to get the corners with our thumb and sand down all our fingerprints and then we end up getting a mouse sander and then an oscillating sander to actually get those but the first 500 of them we literally just sanded with a piece of 180 grit sandpaper like this and so it took about 10 to 15 minutes to per one we eventually got that number down to about five minutes per docking station but the original was it was brutal. So in general, how we finished them is we just put stain on them that we found at Lowe's and Home Depot. Uh, it wasn't fancy stain, it was just Minwax, you know, penetrating stain. And we used natural, golden pecan, dark walnut, red oak, and provincial. And that was the five stains we used to stain them all. Some of the early challenges that we faced when they first started selling, um, and in that first eight weeks that we unleashed them, they sold you know, about $50,000 in sales. And some of the struggles were like, just legitly that CNC cutting out enough. And we'd have to run it 24 hours a day in order to cut out enough. And we thought we couldn't really up the speed any. When we first did it, we were just going by, it sounds good. You know, we were cutting it out. It sounds good. We found out we weren't running it fast enough and it was dulling our bits pretty quick. Just getting enough product to sand and ship out was kind of the issue. So we were selling more than what our capacity was. So we were running 24 hour shifts in those early days. So whenever we first started with them, I already had one employee um, and he's still with us today. Hi, I'm Anthony Rocha. I'm 27 years old, been in El Campo all my life. And I am the CNC operator. We're working Ryan for about six or seven years already, probably going on seven. He was originally with me just to help sand cutting boards and stuff like that. While I was in college, he'd be back here sanding cutting boards. I'd come home on the weekends, I'd glue up cutting boards and he'd sand them. Soon enough, we were getting so busy during the week that my dad would actually come home after work and program them on the CNC and then cut them out. Ryan was going to college. I had a full-time job and he was making more money than I was going to college making these phone docks. And, you know, and I'm thinking, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> you know, when he was gone, we were getting five or six a week, which was, you know, pretty good. And then we started getting more, and I would program and go cut them out, sand them, stain them. And then my mom would ship them out the next day. I did the, all the shipping from right here, the staining, the sanding. We just took up the slack. 2, 3 a.m., still out there sanding and staining. They were extremely helpful in those early stages, as was Anthony, with while I was trying to go to college and put myself through school, they were helping me during the week. I'd come out on the weekends, I'd try to pound out as much as I could, and then they would get any trickle through orders that happened during the week. It was a certain size where we can just fit it in a flat rate envelope, super cheap to ship those, and so uh, we really got away with not having to buy boxes or anything like that. And then we started shipping a lot of them, so then we had to call like corporate and they'd ship us a whole pallet of it. Um, and then we switched over to FedEx eventually, and then we had to call FedEx and they'd ship us a whole 18-wheeler load of these envelopes. And they, you know, obviously stacked really well. And so we just take the thing, slide an envelope, stick a label on it, ship it. 
I started engraving them after that first full year. That really differentiated myself and taught me a ton of lessons um, once I did that. And why I thought of the engraving is um, I read a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And it taught me, you know, the number one thing to a person is their name. So I was like, well, I'm just gonna sell somebody their name. Once I started selling that, my profits margins went up and my sales doubled overnight once I started adding personalization. I put them on Etsy because I didn't know how to build a website. I didn't think they were a store type product. And so I just kind of put them on Etsy and took some good pictures and just kind of threw them out there. Other than that, I didn't really do anything. I didn't, I, I ran a couple ads on Etsy, but nothing else, no website, no Google ads, no stores, nothing like that. Once again, I think that's one of those luck things that I just happened to stumble upon Etsy, happened to put it on there, and it happened to be a good fit. I came out with it beginning of October 20, 2016. Within the first eight weeks, we did $50,000 in sales. So like I was onto something because the previous year's total, I didn't even do $15,000 in sales, <laughs> you know? And then another thing that I did that really skyrocketed us was I started offering different colors and nobody else was offering different colors at the time. That kind of propelled my product above everybody else. When I knew I was onto something, it was starting up in May 2017 it started taking off for Father's Day. Two weeks or three weeks before Father's Day, we were getting two, 300 orders a day. So the rush, um, it's very hard to put into words. You would have to see it. Unbelievable. 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, I'd be up at the computer printing label upon label upon label. We were making it and shipping it and customizing it and trying to fulfill all the orders and doing all the customer service, which nobody ever thinks about. When the rush hit, I would say I have probably worked around 12 hour days, most days. And then they started getting more and more and more. And you know, I'd go to work, I'd come home, I'd program 25, 30 of them a day. And... The, the rush is nuts. I mean, shipping wise, imagine finding 500 different people's names in a thing and reading off of a little piece of paper following a line like this is Susan and she gets this color and it's it's shipping to Bob. And spread them out over my whole living room, the whole floor was covered and then we tried lining them up and we'd start calling them out and putting on the labels and then we had stacks higher than the sofa. Preventro Dad Stuff Font 2 WBL. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. I got so comfortable with sanding that no matter what I did, it was detailing, it was messing with the orbital sander, I even did the hand motions and everything, flipped it around, felt it, made sure it was right. Regardless of what I did, I still kept working despite me sleeping. You were asleep sanding. I was asleep sanding. From our first year, we did about $50,000 in sales. The next year, we did $150,000. The next year, we did $450,000. The next year, we did $650,000. And the next year, we did $1.6 million with just the docking station. When did I decide to expand? That was always in the back of my head. I always planned on growing this thing to a huge company. You know, so expansion was always in my mind from day one. I never thought to not expand. I always told myself that I'm not smart enough to spend it in a good way, so just reinvest it back into the business, and that's always what I did. Um, I figured there's no 20-year-old that I know that spends money in a good way, and so I was going to make sure I wasn't going to be that 20-year-old that spent money in a bad way, and so everything I made, I just always bought new equipment, and by the time I graduated college, I was able to buy two acres of land and started building my dream shop that I'm in now. That's kind of where all the money went. I literally just saved every penny I could. You know, even now I still live in a trailer house behind the shop because now my dream shop is even bigger than this one and I have bigger ambitions. And so, um, yeah, I just put everything I could back in the new equipment and, you know, just treated people good. So the product started to fall off probably the year after COVID. So 2021, it started to fall off and that's when I kind of learned about product life cycles. Why it spiked during 2020 was because everybody was at home, they couldn't see their dad, so they shopped online. And I happened to have a product that works great for sending to dads. You can customize it, tell them, I love you dad, or put dad stuff, I love you, engraved on it. And then now it still does pretty good, but it doesn't do those numbers that it did back in the day. 
and you know it's all about that bell curve and then it kind of flattening out now there's thousands of different designs so many people got in right people usually destroy good things uh, if you have it <laughs> so if you have a good design um, within three years there's going to be thousands of them For a long time, I thought I was just really lucky and not skilled, and I actually had a lot of really weird issues where it was like, am I good, did I just get lucky, am I a real woodworker, do I know what I'm doing, do I know how to run a business, did I just get lucky with this product? And uh, that sat with me for quite some time, even when I was through college, right? I was doing really good, it was selling, right? But I almost thought it was luck. And now after reflecting back on everything, and taking what I did learn and applying it to my business now, I'm really happy it came about. Obviously it built the barn, so like I'm grateful for that. But as far as personal growth goes, it helped out a ton because I, I extrapolated so many different lessons from it that I never thought I did. People always got mad at me. They're like, Ryan, what's next? What happens when this burns out? And I always told them like, I don't care if it burns out, right? Like I'm making money from it now and that's okay. And my analogy I always give them, um, since I was raised up on a farm, I had to milk a cow before I went to school. I always told them if the cow is standing there, milk it and get all the milk you can before she kicks you or she flips your tail at you. And so that was kind of where I went with this product is like, it's, it's, it's making money now. Let's make sure we make all we can from it. And then we'll figure out the rest afterwards. Don't worry about the future that you cannot predict now. Just worry about the present. And um, that has really helped me when designing new products and when kind of taking on new businesses and new business ventures. Family was definitely a crucial part. They were always there when I was in college, right? My parents were there like shipping out stuff. I actually got my dad to quit his job whenever I was 21 and actually start working for me. So both of my parents started working full time for me whenever I was 21 years old. Ryan had asked me, Dad, we're getting busy. You know, if you want to quit your job and come help me, uh, you know, that'd be nice. And so it didn't take long for me to decide. They were super critical during those rush times where we had to go from five employees during the year to 25. Well, what I'm impressed is that he's, you know, as young as he is doing what he's doing, most of the time you just see, you know, older, older folks doing stuff. They were always very supportive of me um, trying to do something with my life, right? Trying to put myself through college. I'm very proud. I mean, he's come a long ways and he's, he had the ideas and, you know, he did it and we all pitched in as a family and... You know, we all just kind of lift each other up, right? And so the, the rising tide lifts all ships and that's what family is. To this business, they're the rising tide that always kind of tries to figure out a way to help out any way they can. We was riding the wave. All in all, this product was an absolute blessing uh, to me, my family, my business, and uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. When those late nights when we were shipping and we were barely getting to the post office on time, that's when I came up with the name Cutting It Close. Because um, remember, if you ain't cutting it close, you ain't cutting it right. <laughs> and they would try to catch me. There was a lot of times they would try to catch me. By the time they pulled out their phone, I, already, I was already looking at them, so they couldn't catch me. Why would you actually say it while you were sleeping? Like, I would, 